Metaphors We Live By is an influential book by linguists and philosophers George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, published in 1980. It's since revolutionised the way we understand language and how we relate our own experiences to the world around us. But what exactly are metaphors? Lakoff and Johnson argue that metaphors aren't just poetry, but a fundamental part of our brain's conceptual system. That is, they're central to the way we perceive ourselves, others, and the world. Lakoff and Johnson write that the essence of metaphor is understanding and experiencing one kind of thing in terms of another. One of the most common examples is All the World's a Stage, an example that draws similarities between acting for an audience and human life in general. Metaphors aren't simply rhetorical, artistic, or creative. They help us understand, structure, and communicate our experience, experiences that are difficult to communicate literally. They write that the concepts that govern our thoughts are not just matters of the intellect. They also govern our everyday functioning, down to the most mundane details. Our concepts structure what we perceive, how we get around in the world, and how we relate to other people. Furthermore, our conceptual system is largely metaphorical. Take the metaphor, argument is war. An argument is a concept. It's partly abstract, a product of human minds. Now look at how we describe it when we use the war metaphor. Your claims are indefensible. There's a weak point in my argument. His criticisms were on target. She shot down and destroyed my arguments. He attacked the argument. Much of how we describe arguing is structured, at least partially, by the concept of war. But not only that, how we describe arguing goes on to affect how we actually argue. In other words, it's not just poetic. The structure of the metaphor determines thought itself. It affects how we think. So, why do we do this? Both war and argument are systematic. Both are structured in a recognisable way that has sides, positions, wins and losses. There are similarities and so we can describe something in a way that people can easily understand. We borrow from something pre-existing to describe something conceptual. Let's take another example. Time is money. Time and money have structural similarities, so we can use one to describe the other. You're wasting my time. This gadget will save you hours. I don't have the time to give you. How do you spend your time these days? That flat tyre cost me an hour. I've invested a lot of time in her. I don't have enough time to spare for that. You're running out of time. There are also orientational metaphors. Orientational metaphors are spatial. For example, happy is often up while sad is down. That boosted my spirits. I'm feeling high. I'm feeling depressed. His mood sank. We also use orientational metaphors to describe how we relate to a concept. I have control over him. I'm on top of the situation. He's under threat. He's at the bottom of the ladder. Lakoff and Johnson argue that most of our experience is organised spatially. And again, as with structural metaphors, there is a shared structure between the two that's coherent. They write that since there are systematic correlates between our emotions, like happiness, and our sensory motor experiences, like erect posture, these form the basis of orientational metaphorical concepts, such as happy is up. Such metaphors allow us to conceptualise our emotions in more sharply defined terms and also relate them to other concepts having to do with general well-being, e.g. health, life, control, etc. They also look at ontological metaphors. When ideas or concepts are abstract, we sometimes have to imagine them as physical objects so as to give them form. Take inflation. We imagine it as an object with physical characteristics. We must combat it or it's out of control. Or take the metaphor of the mind as a machine. My mind isn't operating. We're trying to grind out the solution. I'm a little rusty. 
My mind is fragile. He broke down. She snapped. She went to pieces. We give the concept a physical form and borrow meaning from the physical world to help describe it. Furthermore, most of the time we describe concepts as if they are physical containers. Container metaphors. We, as humans, are physical objects. We have an inside and an outside, like other entities in the world, and the world and universe itself. Containers are a structural part of our very being. They're universal. We organise human concepts, ideas and plans as if they too were containers. For example, are you in the race? Race as a container. Are you going to the race, watching the container? Did you see the finish, the end of the container? Jobs too are thought of as containers. How did you get out of doing that job? How did you get into that line of work? Or take some other examples. He's in love. We're out of trouble now. He's coming out of the coma. I'm slowly getting into shape. He entered a state of euphoria. He fell into a depression. Container metaphors help us think about how we relate to a concept, whether we're part of it, in it, experiencing it or not. But all of these types of metaphor can be mixed together. They're not mutually exclusive. Take love is a journey. It combines all of these types. Look how far we've come. We're at a crossroads. We'll have to go our separate ways. We can't turn back now. I don't think this relationship is going anywhere. Where are we? We're stuck. It's been a long bumpy road. The relationship is a dead end street. Our marriage is on the rocks. We've gotten off the track. The relationship is foundering. These are structural, orientational and ontological. But importantly for Lakoff and Johnson, metaphors are culturally conditioned. Take the concepts of labour and time. They argue that both labour and time are seen as resources that are culturally grounded in a particular way that draws on our Western relationship to material resources. Material resources can be quantified. They have a value, a purpose. They get used up. In the same way, we think of labour as a kind of activity that can be quantified, can be assigned a value serves a purposeful end, and is used up as it serves its purpose. Time too can be quantified, has a value, serves a purposeful end, and is used up. They write, Labour is a resource, and time is a resource, are by no means universal. They emerged naturally in our culture because of the way we view work, our passion for quantification, and our obsession with purposeful ends. They continue, the resource metaphors for labour and time hide all sorts of possible conceptions of labour and time that exist in other cultures and in some subcultures of our own society. The idea that work can be play, that inactivity can be productive, for example. So Lakoff and Johnson have a progressive understanding about how metaphors can change over time. New metaphors are creative and imaginative and can change the very way that we think. They use the example of love being a collaborative work of art. Love is work. Love is active. Love requires cooperation. Love requires dedication. Love requires patience. Love brings frustration, needs communication, is an aesthetic experience, involves creativity, requires a shared aesthetic and cannot be achieved by formula. They argue that thinking like this could change the very way we approach love itself, the very way we think about it, and so what the outcome of thinking about it is. Metaphors We Live By has been an influential book. In one 2002 study, for example, Carola Scott looks at the metaphors cancer patients use. She argues that this can help us understand how we can gain a richer understanding of how we structure abstract, emotional or other experiences that are not clearly delineated. Cancer is often described as an other, eating and invading the body. Combating cancer is a common metaphor. Is this helpful for patients' mental health? She argues this combating metaphor is outdated, relying on old-fashioned ways of treating illness. In another essay, Sarah Higginbotham looks at metaphors of violence. 
She cites a study that gave a fictional newspaper article to readers that reported that Addison City saw a 19% rise in crime and 52% rise in the murder rate in 2004. They gave out two articles, though, that were identical except for one difference. In one, crime was described as a beast ravaging the city, while in another, crime was described as a virus ravaging the city. 71% of those that read that crime was a beast opted for enforcement strategies in a conversation after, while only 54% did who read crime was a virus. Beasts are evil. They have agency. They're big and attackable, whereas the idea of a virus has a very different connotation. Metaphors We Live By is a powerful book and has revolutionary consequences that are only just being understood. Metaphor studies are becoming a larger area of research and have an increasing influence on the other humanities. I'd go into more detail, but rather than say that time is running out, I'll borrow from Christopher Morley. Time is a flowing river. Happy those who allow themselves to be carried and resisting with the current. They float through easy days. They live unquestioning in the moment. If you like these videos, I need your help, and here's my request. If you think you get the same value from four of these videos as you do from just one cup of coffee, then please consider pledging just a dollar per video. That's three to four dollars per month to keep this channel going. You can even limit your pledge to one dollar a month, and if you pledge five dollars, I'll add your name to the credits. To those that already support then and now, thank you so much. This channel just wouldn't exist without you. You can also hit like, share, follow me on Twitter and Facebook, etc. All of these things really contribute to helping then and now. I grow. Thanks for watching and see you next week.